Well, good Wednesday evening, Harrisville Baptist Church and community. We're glad to see you. Um, and i uh, tell you what, had a great weekend having folks back on campus for our worship service. Uh, we got a big Sunday coming up this Sunday. Uh, again, live in worship, in person. We hope everybody will be able to be there. We're going to recognize our moms since we missed Mother's Day, being able to meet in person. And also we're going to recognize our dads because we missed Father's Day uh, and not being able to meet in person. And also another very special group is our graduates. We had several folks that graduated from high school uh, and from college and from various other degree programs. And so we want to celebrate them as well. So it's going to be a busy Sunday morning, lots of stuff going on. We're going to have a youth event out in the gym right after church and uh, get our students back together after so many weeks and months of being off and apart from each other and just a lot of great, great things going on. So uh, we encourage you to be a part of this weekend and as we're excited to have our prayer meeting to go in tonight, let's go to Lord in prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, we love you and God, we thank you so much, Father, for the way that you're working in our hearts. God, it's only through Jesus that we understand that we can have a relationship with you, and we thank you for him, and that you, through our faith in him, you change us, Father, and you change our very hearts and change us into new creations. You make us new in, in our salvation. God, we, in that, we have a relationship with you, and we're so thankful for that, that we can cry out with the, the burdens of our heart, that we can celebrate and thank you for the great gifts and blessings in our lives, and Father, that we can come and back and forth with you in communication and prayer. God, thank you for the gift that that is as well. Father, we thank you for those who are, who are on our prayer list, Lord, for how much they mean to us, God, whether they are someone that everybody knows or someone that is a distant relative or someone who maybe doesn't live in our community. Uh, we pray for them nonetheless this evening, Father, and we ask, Lord, that you would work your will in what each of them are going through. God, we thank you for the future of our church and where you're taking us. God, help us to, to not be reluctant to go there, but, Father, to be excited about the work you are doing and how you would have us to be a part of your kingdom work right here in the Harrisville community. We love you, Lord, and we ask that this time be a blessing to you and a blessing to each of us as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, folks, this evening, as you're looking at your prayer list, hope you've had a chance to take a look at it there in, in the previous post to this one. Um, we have a, a couple of updates, uh, some which we've talked about, but many of which we haven't. Um, we know that Miss Bobby Godby is continuing to improve in the hospital. She's, uh, she's continuing to, to fight against COVID, and, and she's getting stronger and stronger, uh, as we understand it here these last several weeks. So we're thankful for her and her recovery, but praying for her to continue in that path as she continues to get better and get over this COVID that so many of us have dealt with uh, and so many more are still dealing with even now. Uh, we're also lifting up Brother James Fortenberry, who we, uh, we know and love very much, who uh, we're so appreciative for him uh, supplying in our pulpit so many times and, and doing a great job in preaching God's word faithfully and, uh, and with power and with boldness here in our congregation as well as so many other places that God uses him to share that message. Uh, of the gospel. So uh, Brother James Fortenberry is in the hospital down in Hattiesburg, so we want to pray for him and uh, that he would be getting the right treatment and uh, that, that he would be growing and, and, and regaining his health as well so that he can come home. Uh, we also want to lift up Miss Kathy Davis. That's uh, Brad Harris's mother-in-law. Uh, that's uh, uh, Melanie Melanie Harris, that's Brad's wife, of course. Uh, that's her mom. And uh, she's in the hospital in Hazelhurst and having some, some health issues. So praying that she would, would recover and that she would also get that good treatment, just what she needs at just the right time. And I'm praying for all of those families as they continue to love their loved one who they can't be with as much because they're in the hospital during these strange and, and hard times. But praying for those families to be strengthened and to be encouraged, uh, especially as they're having a loved one dealing with illness. Uh, I want to continue to pray for the family of Miss Mickey Everett. That's uh, Corey Harrington's grandmother who passed away recently. Continue to pray for Corey and for Erica, uh, for Corey's brother uh, and, and their, his parents, as well as their whole family as they mourn the loss of Miss Mickey. Um, and uh, pray for, uh, she'd been one of our, our long-term care uh, residents that we've been praying for for a while. And so uh, we have several others of those that we want to continue to pray for uh, as we think about the passing of Miss Mickey. Uh, also, uh, Miss Linda Bowen, uh, a week or two, well, a little over a week or so ago, I think, uh, if, I'm, if my days are right, uh, fell and broke her foot. So uh, we're praying uh, that she seems to be doing well and, and seems to be recovering. And I uh, just want to pray for, uh, continue to pray for her that she'd be back up on her feet and moving around uh, unencumbered by uh, that broken foot. So praying for continued healing there. Uh, and then Jamie Smith, one of our students we talked about last week, been praying for her. Uh, she had a big day today with her, uh, her entrance exam and physical for the air guard. That's part of the future that God has led her to. And so she was excited and, and uh, 
prayed for her and continue to pray for her in taking care of that this morning. Uh, but also this, this week, she's going to have surgery. She's going to have uh, some gallbladder surgery. So I want to pray for Jamie continually uh, as she gets ready to have that procedure on Friday. Um, then also Miss Kathy Brown under our cancer patient list. Miss Kathy is uh, Miss Ethel's sister, and uh, we want to pray for Miss Kathy as cancer has, uh, has, has come back and is, is widespread in her body. Uh, so lift up Miss Ethel and her sisters as well, Miss Patricia, who often is in the audience there on Facebook with us. Uh, we're praying for their family and, and we ask that you would continue to lift them up. Folks, we, uh, we are, as I said, getting a, a youth event back. In fact, even while this is being broadcast, we're uh, going to be out in the youth room welcoming our, our new seventh graders up into the student ministry. And, and uh, that's an exciting time for them. It's been postponed by so many weeks because of COVID and all the shutdowns and things like that. Uh, but, but as things start to get back going again, and, and as we started worship services back this past Sunday, um, and, and, and October 4th is the day that we're looking to open up Sunday school and Sunday evening Bible study, as well as Wednesday night prayer meeting and activities in person again. We'll continue to stream all those things, but as they're getting back going on campus, just continue to pray to the Lord that he'd continue to guide us and direct us, and that he'd also continue to protect us. Um, we, uh, we had that rash of COVID come through our community, and, uh, and thankfully it didn't get any worse than it did, but it's still a risk out there. So uh, we just, uh, we're praying to the Lord that he will protect us as we do meet back together, uh, that we would be doing so safely and uh, in the palm of his hands and in his loving arms, uh, in his protection as we, uh, as we move forward. We're so excited to be back in person in so many ways. Uh, what about you this evening? Who are some people that you would like for us to pray for? Uh, who are some people you're praying for and like to maybe update us on? Uh, let us know here below in the comment in these next few minutes. All right, well, wherever you are, if you'll take just a second and uh, let's join together in a word of prayer, lifting up these prayer requests, these folks that we've been talking about and anything else that God has put on your heart. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you, and Father, we thank you so much, Father, for the people who you've put in our lives that give us love and that we are able to return and give love to as well. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that they mean so much to us, that they are so much a part of our story with you, and so many of them have influenced us towards better following you and, and learning more about you. And Father, so many of them have been recipients of, of us getting to minister to them in the same ways. 
Lord God, in, in having these great relationships, Father. We celebrate and we, we get so excited when things go well. But Father, when tough things happen, when disease, when, when illness and, and, and even passing away happens, Lord, we, we grieve deeply for those that we love and have good relationships with. Lord God, help us, Father, in our, in our times of questioning, in our times of, of not knowing what's going on and what the next moment will hold, much less the next day, week, month, or year. Father, help us, Lord, to trust you, especially with the relationships that you've blessed us with. We believe that those good relationships, if they're worth anything, they come from you. And Father, we give you glory for that. And we ask that you take and, and, and protect and, and provide for each and every one who's on our prayer list, the ones we mentioned this evening and the ones that we haven't said out loud, maybe in quite some time, but we've been continuing to pray for. We lift them up to you, Father. Would you comfort them? Would you heal them? Would you work in their lives and let them know that you and only you are the source of salvation and all things good for their lives and for all of our lives? And God, draw them closer to you, and we pray for their families as well, that you would do the same thing in drawing them closer to you and closer to one another, Father, as they deal with these issues and these sicknesses and the, and the passings uh, that go on in day-to-day -day life. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for getting back together in person on our campus. We've missed it for so much time and, so, and for so long, Lord. We thank you that you've seen fit to open us back up, and thank you that we were able to do so this past weekend safely. We pray for safety going forward and for wise choices for each and every one of us uh, as we minister to each other, just simply by how we interact during this time. So, Father, continue to put your hand of protection and your hand of power growing more and more over our church, and, Father, help us to grow in it and under that hand. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that if we are to accomplish anything that is worthwhile, Father, that it will be when we follow you and it will be in your will. So, God, we seek that. Would you speak to us now, Father, as we think about how, how we are to be as we follow you here as individuals, as followers of Christ, and, Father, as a church made up of those followers of Christ. We love you, Lord. Speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember that this weekend we will be uh, doing deacon nomination. We'll, uh, you'll, when you come on Sunday morning, you'll receive a, a card uh, that has all the people who, you know, men who can be nominated for deacons for this coming church year. Uh, so, uh, and you'll be able to, to circle up to three of those, and that'll be happening in our worship service on Sunday morning as well. Um, if you are, are not able to come yet, if, if you're still at home, not still sure about getting out about, around a bunch of people, and we certainly respect and understand that during these times, uh, but if you'd like to make a nomination, uh, let us know in the church office and, uh, and, and just let Angela know tomorrow, and we'll make sure to get you a, uh, one of those cards, one of those ballots, so that you can make your nomination. If you already know who you'd like to nominate, that's fine. You can, you can certainly let us know that as well, but if you'd like to take a look at the card, then you're welcome to do that too. So just let us know, and uh, we'll work in that direction. Well, this past weekend, we looked at a very short uh, and, and quick hitter type of, uh, of, of biblical book. We looked at the epistle of Jude, and, and Jude wrote a letter to a church that he cared very much about uh, that also speaks to us and all of the churches that follow Christ even today, uh, 2,000 years later. He wrote to him about what to do and how to, to, how to be when false teachers uh, and false, uh, false prophets enter into the fellowship and how to, uh, how to go about identifying them, what, knowing what they are and what they're looking like and what they do and, and the result of what their actions will, will be in a church and, and in an organization and a family. And we talked a lot about the false teachers, but, but this weekend, uh, as we did that, I kind of thought, well, we need to talk a little bit about, uh, well, how do we need to be? How, you know, how do we, we need to spend a little time on how we need to be to keep from falling into the temptation of being those false teachers, those false prophets, those, those people who say and look the part, but, but don't really have the right motivation. And so we take a look in Colossians chapter three this evening. Uh, we're going to read the first 17 verses there in that chapter and, and see what God says about how we are to, uh, to live as Christians. And so this is much more of a positive direction instead of speaking to the negative uh, characteristics of those false prophets. Uh, but, but God speaks to us here in Colossians chapter 3. Let's take a look at what, what we see there. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 we read, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died... And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. 
Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator." Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell, dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Paul writes this letter, also just like Jude, to a church that he loves. He writes to the church at Colossae, and, and he's teaching them many things, including what we've just read, in how to live as God's saved people kingdom people, how to live as followers of Christ, what we should, we should be about. Now, of course, anytime we're learning what to be, we have to also learn what not to be. So I told you this would be a positive look. It, it speaks a little bit about things not to be, kind of in a negative fashion, and then it turns it quick, uh, quickly around into talking about things uh, in a much more positive direction. So let's take a look at it and break it down. The church at Colossae was just like us. It, it, they, they were people, and, and, and that's something we have to always remember when we look at the scriptural churches is that they were made up of people just like us and have the same temptations and the same problems. They may manifest themselves in different ways at different times, but, but they are human people who have put their faith in Christ and who are dealing with battling against the sinful nature, even though Christ has already made a way for them to be delivered from it. They're still fighting that battle, just like you and I are. So nothing different for us, but so important to see what, what he says here. And in verse 1 we read, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This idea of being raised with Christ, well, what, is, what does that actually mean? Well, we know that, that part of our hope is that when Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise, and we will rise with Christ. And those who are still alive will be taken up with him in the air, Scripture teaches us. And so this idea of, of the, that we would be raised with Christ, well, there's a little bit more to it than just simply the rapture or just simply the second coming. This idea of being raised speaks back to the raising of the dead uh, of Christ uh, in, in, in the resurrection. And so this idea here is central to the theme of what it means to live as a Christian is we live as resurrected people. And that's uh, when we celebrate and when we are obedient in baptism, uh, we, we do so as a picture of what it is when we come to Christ. And if you remember that, uh, we're looking forward to a couple of baptisms coming up here in the next few weeks. But... As, we, as you see that, and when those, those folks will get baptized, think about this. Make sure you understand what it is. And I'm sure you'll hear me explain it again uh, as a reminder. But, but it's a picture. So we walk into the water, and, and it's our old life. And we, then we are dipped down, lowered into, submersed into the water. And that's a picture of us dying to our old self and being buried in the grave. And then when we come out of the water, we come out just as a picture as, of resurrection, clean, new creations. And then we walk into the rest of our life. Now, baptism, again, is just a picture, but it's a picture of this resurrection life. We don't only simply live resurrection life when Christ raises us from the grave. We, if we are followers of Christ, are living resurrection life, raised up life, as, as Colossians 3.1 mentions, in that we have died to our old selves and we've been raised again. And he's going to hit on that a few more times in the passage we've read. And, and so it's important that we understand the, the picture there. The concept there is that we're not our old selves. We have died to our old selves and we are new. And therefore, all the old needs to have passed away. Now, we still battle letting it come back and letting it creep back in and sometimes letting it run and flow back in fully in our life. But the old has been put to death. 
by our submission of our life to Christ. He's put it to death just like he died on the cross and just like sin died on the cross. But we still have that battle going on. And so this is a reminder throughout that while we're in that battle, until the time when God wipes it all away in the second coming of Christ, and we don't have to worry about the battles anymore because there'll be no more battles to be fought. Until that time, we need to make sure that we're encouraged to live according to what we're reading and studying this evening. So he says, since you have been raised, that's impli implying that you are a Christian in this audience here. We can't simply just try to do these things without actually having put our faith in Christ. And that's where so many people get so confused and get so off kilter in what they think is biblical faith is they start to do all the things or try to do all the things that the Bible says, but they've missed the one big part that makes all of that worthwhile and even effective in their lives. And that is putting their solid and full faith in Jesus Christ. He says, so since you've done that, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is and he's seated at the right hand of God. We know that that's where he went when he ascended from this earth and that's where he awaits until the father turns to him and says, go and bring my people home. Um, he says, and in verse two, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. In other words, our mindset, it's not that we never deal with the earthly world, but our mindset, our goals, the things that we are setting as, as standards in our lives need to be the heavenly things, not the earthly things. We still need to be considerate of people that we're around on, on earth. We've seen about how to use our freedoms and how things like that make a difference in how we witness to them and how we minister to them. But we're to set our, our eyes on things above, set our eyes on heavenly things, godly things. The godly things are the standard in our life now, not the standards of the world. He says, for you died, again, going back to that imagery, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Verse four goes on to say, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. And that's the thing that we all look forward to, but catch that first part of that in verse three. You have, you've died to your old self. That's what he's saying. And now you're hidden in Christ. The life that we have post-salvation is not life for us. It's not life in us. And it's not life certainly from us. It's all in Christ. And so our sin is hidden in Christ. It's been taken care of. It's been forgiven. It's, we've been redeemed of that. Our power is in Christ. It comes from him and not us. Uh, our, our, our righteousness comes from him. It doesn't come from things that we've accomplished. It just plays itself out in how he has changed us from the inside out. He says, and we look forward to a time that because of that, and only because of that faith in Christ and his work in us, then we can look forward to an eternity with him in glory. If we've not put our faith in Christ, if we haven't died to our old self, then we don't get the glory part. We don't get to be hidden in him because we're not yet in him. It's so important to us uh, as, as believers in Christ that we get that. It's not just something, Jesus is not something, or Christianity is not a thing that we add into our life. No, we die to our old selves and we are given life by him. Now you may say, well, Rich, that just sounds like semantics. That just sounds like the, you know, some fancy wording of it. That is truly the biblical picture of salvation and living out salvation, is understanding that the old has passed away and we've been made new creations. We are new in him and that we are resurrected from our old dead lives. You know, it's not, Jesus doesn't save good people or bad people. He saves dead people. Uh, apart from him, we are dead in our sins. The Bible tells us that uh, repeatedly. And so we are raised up only when we put our faith in Christ. He says, because of all that, we should do these things. He says, first off, he speaks a little bit towards the things in a negative manner, the things we need to do away with. He says, put to death, therefore. In other words, since the old us has died, then the old ways of us, which he's about to list some of, need to pass away and be put to death as well. Um, and, and that's an active putting to death, not just a, oh, well, I hope they just kind of get old and die and pass away. No, we execute them. They, they, are, they are guilty of causing us to be separated from God. And so therefore they are, they're given the death penalty. And that's what he's saying here. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he gives us some examples, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And he says greed, by the way, kind of parenthetically speaking, he says, which is idolatry. 
Greed is idolatry. Greed, when we want more things, it's simply whatever things we're wanting, we've made as idols. We, if we want more of that than we want more of God, then we have an idol in our life. And we have to be careful of that. We have to be prayerful about how God takes those idols away and how we give them up willingly and put to death that idolatry in our life. He mentions things like sexual immorality, impurity, and lust um, that all come from evil desires, as he mentions as well. That is uh, the, the sexual identity crisis that's going on in our culture, um, all, of, all of the many perversions of, of sexuality, the way that God had intended it, um, the, the things that have taken away from what he intended, all of that's not new. We just know a lot more about it now. It's not behind as many closed doors uh, and, and hidden in as many bedrooms as it used to be. We know about it more. It's more shown on TV and just regular cable television, or excuse me, over the air television. It doesn't have to be cable. And it's certainly prevalent all throughout the internet and, uh, and in so much of our media. But it's not new. What does he first tell them to put to death? Well, these sexual desires, these, these, these desires that are contrary to what God has set sex up to be, which is a beautiful thing in the right practice within faith in Christ. Uh, but, but again, without that, it's all a perversion. It's being used for something else that it was intended to be used for. He says in verse 6, Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Well, sin is what these all represent and what these are all examples of. And sin invites and beckons and ushers in the wrath of God. But the great thing about that is, is because, is, is because Christ has done what Christ has done, we don't have to face that wrath. We had those desires. We, we maybe participated in many of these examples and so many more of sin, but we don't have to have the wrath. Now, that doesn't mean we get a get out of jail free card and we just keep doing what we want. But again, we've put our old self to death and we've let Christ raise, raise us up again. And so now we walk and live and grow in him in this forgiven state. It says uh, that because of that sin, that's when the wrath was coming, but because of God's grace through Christ, we don't have to experience the wrath. He's taken the, the punishment of the wrath for us. He says, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. In verse 7, he says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. This is all past tense. You say, well, Rich, what about, what about when I've given my life to Christ and I truly have trusted him, but I still find myself falling back into this? Well, understand that you are forgiven. He knew that you were going to do those things. You're forgiven in advance. Christ doesn't have to die again. You don't have to get saved again. But the question I would ask you is, is what's characterizing your life? What, what is not just what other people would say about you in the public circles, but what is true in your own life? He speaks about these things in the past tense for someone who's on the right path. And that's how we should speak about these evil desires, these evil actions, these sinful uh, practices. They should be in the past tense and should be growingly in the past tense in us in that we're overcoming that. Sometimes it's harder to break habits than others, uh, but God has made a way for them to be broken. We need to let him and participate in that, putting those things to death. He says, but now, but now, you used to live in these in verse 7, but now in verse 8, you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. And he gives some more examples. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Well, let's, let's just take a few of those. These are all linked because this deals with, with how we interact with people. Anger. If we're quick to anger, we've got to check to see if we're maturing in Christ. That's just biblical, biblically speaking. If we're quick to be angry, we've got to check ourselves because Christ had every reason to be angry uh, about what it was costing him to save us. And yet he was able to respond in love. You say, oh, well, he, overchanged, he overthrew the money changers in the temple. I get that. But how many other things did he do? I mean, even if that was him, and, and, and as we understand it to be him reacting in anger, how much more anger would he have been justified in our eyes of, of showing throughout when the disciples said and did boneheaded things, when, when, when the people around him hurled insults at him, when they beat him, when they stripped him, when they crucified him, how much anger could he have shown at that point? And so what we see here is, is that, that anger is not the way that we're supposed to respond. Also, similarly, not just anger, rage. Well, rage comes from anger, and the more anger builds up, it kind of leads to rage. That needs to be gone as well. Malice, that, that malicious, literally, that's where that word comes from, malicious, uh, but, but malice, that, that evil intention that we want bad to happen to people, 
Praise the Lord that Christ, our example, didn't want bad to happen to us. Or guess what? Bad would always be happening to us. We face some bad now, but it's nothing, nothing compared to what it would be if Christ had, had wanted bad things to happen to us, had chosen to make bad things happen to us if he had malice for us. Slander, talking bad about people, um, not just, well, I'm telling the truth in love. No, talking about seriously trying to put people down and, and destroy their reputation. And he says, and filthy language from your lips. In other words, language that's not godly. Remember, it's not degrees of dirty or filthy. Uh, it, it's either godly or it's, it's evil. It's godly and clean or it's not and it's filthy. And he's saying, remove all that language from your lips. He says, do not lie to each other. So tell the truth. Since you have been taken off your uh, taken off your old self with it, oh, excuse, excuse me, sorry. Since you have taken off your old self with its practice, I'll make the sense of the English here in just a second. We've taken off that that old identity and stepped into and put on the identity of Christ. He says, and have put on in verse ten the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its Creator. That idea there, that picture is, is that. Each day, as we put away all the old, as we put to death all the old sinful things, we start to look more and more like Christ. It's literally we put Christ on like we would a set of clothing, and we start to look more like him, and we start to, to quote-unquote, dress and be the part of Christian. He says in verse 11, he says, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. I, I really believe that in context here, what he's saying here is that as we start to all look more like Christ, we stop looking more and more different from one another. We start to see much more of the commonality of Christ within us, and therefore it's not about our earthly divisions of things. It's about us having unity in Jesus Christ. He is in all, and, and he is all. In other words, the more we look like Christ, the more Christ we see. In verse 12, he says, Therefore, because of all this, putting all this stuff away and putting on Christ as God's chosen people, he chose us. You say, well, wait a minute, I chose to put my life in him, but we couldn't choose that if he hadn't chosen us before. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Are we holy because we were holy by ourselves? No, he chose us he redeemed us as he let us put our faith in Christ, and he made us holy. And at judgment, that's what will be considered, and dearly loved. He's not mad at us. Think about the people that you dearly love. You will do anything for them. You will provide for them. You'll risk yourself. You'll give yourself for them. He dearly loves us in that way. He says, clothe yourselves with, and then he describes Jesus. He says, he's already told us to put on Christ. He says, to clothe yourselves with compassion. Jesus is the pinnacle of compassion, kindness. Jesus is the ultimate example of how to be kind, humility. Jesus is, is perfect in how he humbled himself to even to death on a cross. Gentleness, his, 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 his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He's gentle to us and patient. So that last one is something that's so tough but is so evident in who Christ is. How patient has he been with me? How patient is he being with you? How patience, How much patience does he show each and every one of us? Those things that he tells us to clothe ourselves with are exact and direct descriptions of who Jesus is. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. In other words, know that we're all going to mess up and that we're all going to need forgiveness from someone and so give it freely. And then he continues to say, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, going back to that example of Christ being who we are supposed to be looking like more and more each day. He says in verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You can't do those things without love. And as those things are done, love ties them together. And that is our banner under Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Christ showed God's love for us in dying for us on the cross, and he showed his love in not staying that way, in raising himself in, or being raised from the dead and resurrected. He shows us what's going to happen and what needs to happen, what we really, if we are honest, what we want to happen in our lives. He says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. We as people, 
especially in 2020 America, we think, oh man, well, I've got some reason to complain this year. I got some reason to be upset about all the, the terrible hand I've been dealt. Christ is the one we have in common with so many, and we need to celebrate that as we are one in body with them. And we need to be thankful for it. We need to be thankful that there are different people than us that are also in Christ that there are people of different colors and different speak different languages and live in different parts of the world and have different levels of income and have different problems and temptations, but they've all, so many of them, put their faith in Christ, just like you and I have, if we've indeed done so. And they're looking more like Christ each and every day. He's put us together as one body known as the church, and it's made up of many local churches, and we are to be thankful for him putting us together, not reluctant to participate with each other, not, not holding a grudge against one another who are our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. What's the message of Christ? It's the message that even though we were apart from God, God loved us enough to redeem us, to give us reconciliation with him through sacrifice on his part. And so he tells us to let that message live richly in us. In other words, that we would have an abundance of it, that we would be abundantly ready and willing to sacrifice so that others might be saved just the way God has done for us. He says, let it, let it dwell amongst you richly as you teach and admonish one another. In other words, as you continue to point each other more and more towards Christ. Guys, I don't have it all together. You don't have it all together. None of us are walking through this life uh, and not messing up the way that we follow Christ and the way that we help influence others to do the same. None of us are doing that perfectly, and so we need each other to, in the love, not in anger, not in malice, not in slander, not in anything other than love and patience and compassion and all those things that he said to put on, we need to make sure that we are lovingly correcting one another. And we need to be willing to take that correction just as freely and just as well as we give it and as we expect the people whom we give it to, to take it. He says, do it through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. You know, we, we not only learn so much from what we sing, but it's the song that God has put in our heart that makes its way out through our voice and through our actions and through our lives. That's what needs to be the, 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 the source of, his work in our life, not just our opinion, not just our comfort, not just our frustration or anything else, but what he's done in our life, that's the source of our songs as well as, as the love and the admonishment um, and, and, and the, the, the teaching that we do for one another. And then finally in verse 17, he says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, folks, this evening it's important for us to remember that what we do as Christ's brothers and sisters, as children of God, as co-heirs to all of eternity and all the glory of the heaven, it, it, we need to make sure that when we are acting as those people, that we are acting in the name of Jesus and not in the name of rich or in the name of whoever you might be, but to make sure that we're acting in Jesus' name. In other words, from his point of view, from his desire, from his will, not from our own. I hope that's true of you this evening. And I hope that for each and every one of us, we can live out Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, more and more as God gives us each passing day. Let's pray together this evening. Lord God, we love you and we thank you, Father, that you're speaking to our hearts in so many ways, not just simply from your word, but from the things you're doing in our midst the things that you're using other believers in our lives to help us to learn and to, to be corrected from and all kinds of things. God, we thank you that you're speaking and working in us and we ask you to continue to do so. Let us look more and more like Jesus and less and less like our old lives before we put our faith in Christ every day. Lord God, help us, Father, to willingly and excitedly put to death those sinful natures and desires and habits in our lives and to let you show us what resurrection life looks like even now. And God, it will only get that much greater when Christ returns and brings us home to be with you. Father, for those who have not given their life to Christ, draw them closer to you, even now. In Jesus' name we pray, and we're thankful. Amen. 
Well, folks, we do love you, and uh, we're so glad to be able to be with you in prayer meeting this evening. We've only got a couple more weeks of prayer meeting on our own until October the 7th, uh, which will be our first time to have prayer meeting back together again, uh, and, and that'll be coming up here pretty quick. So be uh, take, taking a look at the bulletin, uh, whether you're getting it in person here on Sunday mornings, it'll have some great announcements about things that are coming up, uh, or whether you're downloading off Facebook and you can do either one and uh, and get some of that information. Give us a holler in the church office. Let us know. Give me a holler personally. If there's anything we can do for you. We love you and praying for you the rest of this week and I uh, hope you have a great one as you continue to put on Christ more and more each day. God bless you.